Du får vara försiktig. Ja, precis. Det är bra. Vi inte att Norge är världens sista sovjet. Jag sätter mig ner här nere. Den på. Hallå, hallå. Is on. Okay, uh, if everybody can uh, join us in the room, it would be excellent and take your seats. Thank you. Hey. 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 Okay. De har de har jobbat hårt i gruppövningar nu i en och en halv timme. Så att först hade vi gäng presentationer och sen har vi haft gruppövningar. Slut. Ja, jag vet, men de det gör inga hemligheter. De har jobbat hårt i grupper att efter att ha haft ett antal inbjudande presentationer. Så att det har varit en interaktion på det sättet. Nu har han fått en adrenalinkick. Nu har han fått en adrenalinkick. Kaffe, gruppövning. Det är väl ett tag bra. Ja, men B, jag vill inte att vi pratar om det. Jag ska faktiskt ta en liten favorit i repris, men, men med ett annat perspektiv. Samma bild, men, men utifrån insikter i polarbröd som det slutar med lag. Ja, det blir, det blir rätt så. Ja, ja, ja. Vi har inget här, va? Nej. Ja. Okej, okay, uh, welcome back everybody. It's uh, Friday afternoon. It's 20 to 4 which means that everybody is very keen on making sure that the moderator will now stick to time. Um, I understand it has been extremely interesting, lively discussions in the respective groups. We will come back to some of the key results, key ideas that uh, has come out of, of those discussions later on in the panel. I can see that you have taken coffee, which is great. And I can also see that most of you have returned back after the group discussions and after the coffee break. And I think, Peter Norman, Minister for Financial Markets, that you are clearly one of the reasons everybody is actually back in the room here and very curious to hear your presentation. We are very pleased to have you here. Um, and to give us um, an update, we can say, state-owned companies in a changing climate. These are the companies that you and the government and the, and the, the parliament, you could say, have control over to some degree. We have discussed this morning a lot what can actually companies, the corporate sector, do based on the knowledge we have, based on the knowledge we do not have. Um, so it would be interesting to hear your perspective because I know you have been pushing very hard the role of nationally owned companies. So please, Peter, the floor is yours and give him an applaud. <coughs> Thank you, Johan. Um, my responsibilities in the government is that I'm responsible, as you can imagine, for financial markets. But more than that, I'm also responsible for the public-owned companies. And uh, that is the topic of, of today, I think, more or less. I'm also responsible for some local municipalities question, as, way, as well as lottery policy, which is <laughs> one of the <laughs> most difficult things you can imagine. I mean, this what Vattenfall, Waterfall, or Nordea, or Essebank, has nothing to uh, <laughs> compare to the lottery, lottery policy. <coughs> Nevertheless, uh, in the climate bill presented by the Swedish government, we have announced objectives for 2020 and a vision of Sweden with a sustainable and resource-effective energy supply and no net emissions of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere in 2050. And the government's <coughs> climate and energy policy targets by 2020 are 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, at least 50% renewable energy, 20% more efficient energy use and at least 10% renewable energy in the transport sector. Uh, of course, I uh, share the view that this question is the greatest, if not the greatest, one of the greatest challenges of, of our time. <coughs> Sweden has a fairly large uh, 
Sweden is a fairly large owner. The, 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 the people of Sweden is a fairly large owner of, of businesses. We have 53 companies. 42 of these are fully owned, 11 partly owned. And if these companies should be on a stock exchange, it should be have a net value of something like 570 to 600 billion Swedish krona. And if that sum is divided by 9 million Swedes, you will find roughly 60,000 krona per Swede. It's the fortune of each Swede in, in, those, in those companies. And I think that is a very large share of, of uh, average Swedes um, savings. <coughs> so um, among other things, it's a great responsibility <coughs> to have this uh, uh, ownership role, of course. And th all of these companies are both large and small. It's one of the big biggest largest employers in Sweden. And, and we have two big private holding companies in Sweden. That is the Wallenberg Sphere Investor and the Handelsbanken Sphere Industrivärden. And this group of companies is more than twice as much as those holding companies together. So that gives you a, 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 a sign of, of the, the importance. We have decided that responsibility management is a key word for, for uh, those companies. We have sustainability very high on the agenda when we meet the companies. And we think this is for a number of reasons. First of all, it's about values. We think as a owner of different companies, it will reflect the values of the government or the parliament, you can say, that this question is of greatest importance. <coughs> More than that, I have the conviction, I'm very certain, that if you want to have profitable companies in the long run, for years and years and years to come. I think that it's important that the companies have these things in order. We can see that in, in questionnaires, when you, when you ask people just, just graduated from high school or universities, that when the young people of today is choosing where to work, the first kind of work they have, they think it's important that this question is in order in, in, the, in those companies. So in order to attract skillful people, it is important that you have these things in order. You also see, quest uh, you also see uh, effects from other part of, of, of group that is linked to, to a firm. For instance, we have problems in the past uh, in one of our companies, Telia, the telecom company who had uh, activities in, in, in Uzbekistan in, in, in Asia, as, as, you, as you might remember. What happened here was that owners sold the shares <coughs> in, in a large extent. And uh, for instance, a client, the, 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 the city of Stockholm, they said, we have 40,000 uh, numbers on Telia. Now we will, we will uh, renew that and have a new kind of a auction process because we don't want to be a customer of this kind of a company. So you see reactions from the customers, you see reactions from the owners, and you will eventually see reactions also from the young people that will not be interesting to work in a firm if you don't have these things, these things in order. <coughs> when we say sustainable, we mean this. We mean environment, human rights, working condition, anti-corruption, business ethics, and gender equality and diversity. This is what we call sustainable. Before we, we, we define these kind of words, we had a variety of different definitions. Now we have one definition, and that makes uh, life somewhat more easier. <coughs> we think that sustainable sustainability in the companies is a strategic question. And if you accept that kind of a definition or that kind of a viewpoint, uh, that question belongs to the board. It is nothing that you can delegate to some consultant uh, far away from, from the leadership. This question must be dealt with in the board of the companies. And, and that's why we have said that all boards in our 53 companies are to define each of them uh, um, uh, sustainable targets that is relevant for the company. And we have said relevant for the company means that sustainable targets should be linked to the business model. It is not enough for instance, to, to send money to Amnesty Business Group or, or, or UNICEF or something like that. You must define targets for sustainability that is linked to the business model. And I think that's the key, really. And that means that the better 
the better the company goes, the, the more results you will have on, on your sustainability um, um, questions as well. We have also said it should be possible to evaluate. It should be few and it should be possible to evaluate. And we want the companies to be ready at, at the latest for first quarter in 2014. Then we will evaluate when we have these quarterly discussions with the companies, their sustainability targets on, on a regular basis, uh, at least e each quarter for, for all of these companies. And as an example, already as of today, we have an iron ore company up north in Sweden called a LKAB. They have already decided in the board that their carbon dioxide emissions per ton will be reduced from 27 kilo of ton product in 2011 to 17 kilo from 2010. It's almost a 50% reduction a new generation of climate smart pellets produced by 2017. Vattenfall, the electricity company, have a strange history. In 1999, their emission of carbon dioxide was zero. In 2006, their emission was one, uh, well, almost 90 million ton per year. And that's more than the entire Sweden has <laughs> as an, uh, emissions. Their hope, uh, uh, I would say, was to have this uh, storage facility. They, they could storage carbon dioxide in the ground, but that failed. So now they are stuck with, with, with this um, carbon assets, especially in Germany. Uh, now we try to, to lower that as well. And uh, the Vattenfall board has decided that the CO2 emissions as a first step will be reduced to 65 million tons by 2020. Uh, and that also, uh, comes from 85 million tons of, of 2012. Um, since we have shortage of time, let me go directly to the, to the summary then. Th the climate change is one of the biggest questions of this generation, if not the biggest. And the state-owned companies should, should do what they can. And they should be role models to the private sector as well. We would like to be in the forefront and we'd like other companies to, 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 to be in our, in, in our tracks. Sustainability targets has to be set by each company depending to its circumstances. And a lot of companies have done this already, but the latest time for all those 53 is fourth, the first quarter of 2014. Then it should be relevant targets uh, linked to the business model that is easy to evaluate for the owners, which is us, all the taxpayers in Sweden. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks a lot, Peter. Um, uh, we appreciate very much that you will stay, so you will actually come back on the panel also. And for, in a very honest way, also presenting some of the challenges that you face in many of the companies and for making it very clear that it has to be part really of a corporate strategy, <coughs> the business, to bring these issues into to the strategy. That's really very, very interesting. We are going to listen to three companies now. Uh, how they have approached uh, this quite quite complex um, uh, complex uh, issue as well on, on a corporate level. So I ask uh, the three representatives if you can come up at the same time actually and stand up here. Uh, Sasha uh, Beslik, Birgitta Riesvik and Anna Borgeryd. Um, we like to see all of you at the same time, isn't that nice? Three very different companies, representing three very different sectors with different opportunities, challenges related to climate, the whole climate issue. Uh, let me start with you, Sasha. Uh, what do you see uh, as the key challenges and how do you address them? Sasha Besley, by the way, is Head of Responsible Investments and Corporate Governance at Nordea. Please. I mean, one of the key challenges for financial institutions when it comes to the climate issues, environmental issues, social issues in general, is actually how we evaluate the p certain risks in our investments and how we then mirror these valuations when we choose which companies to invest in and which companies not to invest in. What we have developed over a couple of years of time is the analysis model that we actually apply on all our investments where we actively see companies who are able to demonstrate to us investors that they actually managing key risks in their business operations that they can evaluate that so we can price it and then we can invest the client's money into this. Mm -hmm. So from our perspective, it's all about money. 
uh, it's all about creating returns. And there is no conflict between being sustainable, being responsible, creating these returns. That's the job, that's the role of a financial institution, that's, that's my job. And I think that we are in a stage of this development, which this seminar also reflects a bit today, that we still need to figure out what valuation models we will use. And that's one of the questions to, to many companies. How do actually what they do on environmental and social or sustainability, how does that correspond to the stock value? of the company and how can we as investors see that and, and pay the premium for that in the cases we want to do that. Mm -hmm. Sasha, uh, Peter Norman also uh, mentioned of course that Nordea is partly part of the portfolio of the government um, and this relationship between the government and, and the companies, um, do you recognize this, this picture described here and do you see how, do you how important is it to have a owner that is very active in also pushing the companies forward? I think it's very important. I think the Swedish government is, I mean, knowing, investing all over the world, we have ac interaction with other governments as well. I think the Swedish government is in the forefront of how they run, how they're trying to run, particularly uh, during the Peter's time, during these couple of years that have passed. In the same time, I think the, the shareholder perspective or the owner perspective plays a huge difference for the companies. It, it legitimizes the, the how prioritization needs to take place, that it actually supports business decisions that are sustainable. So that plays a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, and going back to the sort of a role, I don't know how much uh, state or Swedish uh, citizens own in Nordea. I think it's 17% now, I don't know. Seven. 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 It was oh. 17, but that you sort of sold it out. <coughs> well, you can have different opinions about that. Uh, but I think from, from, um, from another perspective, what we need in the financial markets, and we have had this discussion before, and we will have it probably in a panel, is that we need a set of rules how all asset managers and all asset owners can disclose how they take this information into account. Mm. Because I think that's a one of the biggest challenges for consumers, for you being able to choose options that fits you, is that the fact, that the really sort of a real fact that that information mm. is not available. And I, thi I don't think we should legislate that financial institutions sh should work with this. I think we should legislate that we disclose information. So it, it's a principle of comply and explain. Mm. Either you disclose mm. and then you can take that into account or you don't. And then it's up to customers to make that decision. I, in the earlier panel, uh, we, we did hear um, from, from our representatives from the corporate sector that th you know they were asking for uh, clear policies really, clear rules and regulations and so on. How, how important is that in the financial sector and how much can Nordea being, I would say, is the biggest bank in the Nordic countries? Yeah, we are the biggest bank. Take the lead in then driving change forward. We, we, we are trying to take the lead by not only in trying to invest, I mean, we do invest in a sustainable way, striving to do that, but we are also trying in, uh, doing initiatives within our own business that is related to, uh, let's see, CO2 footprinting of our investment products. We have started doing that. Nobody told us to do it, but we are doing it because mm -hmm. we want to see how do we indirectly emit CO2 emissions in our products and how we can reduce that and offer that to our clients as opportunity to invest in. That's one of the things mm -hmm. that we can do. The other thing we can do is that, that we can actually incentivize our portfolio managers, our sort of internal people throughout the different measures that we can take to take into account sustainability environmental and social issues in, in, in the way how they evaluate companies and how they invest. Mm. Just a final quick question, Sasha. Um, the push to do more or the push to do better in, in, in this area, broader sustainability in a way, but also then relates to, of course, uh, you know, incorporating climate change as part of your investment strategies and so on. Is it coming more from top down from your owners, where the Swedish government is one, or is it a bottom up where your customers is actually asking for this? Or is it internally, it's the bank itself and the leadership in the bank that is, you know, the champions? I, I would say it comes from, uh, and this is so interesting picture, and it does not correspond what people usually think in Sweden, I think, when it comes to investment. It comes from long-term oriented institutional investors. Mm -hmm. It comes from institutions that have a lot of money. They're very concerned about the 5, 10, 15, 20 years, but they also have fiduciary duty. Consumers in Sweden, in general, are not... <laughs> They're not acting so much. They're not putting their mouth where the money is. Uh, so it's, it's, we have a perception that we are responsible. But when it comes to this part of the world, which is the financial, I don't think that corresponds to the picture. Um, 
internally it is important because we see that we are running a risk, talking about the uh, stranded assets. I don't know if you heard about that, about the potential stranded assets that we are sitting on, that we are investing on, based on the fact that fossil fuels companies, or particularly the mm. companies who are very heavy on the fossil fuels, may be overpriced on the market, mm. given that we need to decrease the, the fossil fuels consumption further on. In principle, that will mean that in some portfolios, let's say Statoil will lose 60% of the stock value. If we were to implement the measures mm. that we need, in fact, that will have a trickle, uh, trickle down a lot of uh, issues for the Petanum and many others when it comes to pensions, because we will lose a lot of money on this. So it is interrelated in so many different angles. Mm. Thanks a lot. Yeah, the whole carbon bubble, um, which I can recommend as, as very interesting reading, uh, of course. And that takes us to the energy sector again, you could say, but, uh, you know, Fortum is not part of the carbon bubble there. Um, so, but Birgitta Resvik, what, what are your perspectives? You have a few slides to show as well. So you can stand on the slides, you can see the slides, and we come and help us with the projector. Thanks. So you can start to talk freely yeah, with the microphone, uh, and then there is a presentation. Can can you help us? Yeah. Okay, I just want to give a short view on how, how we are addressing uh, these issues, and um, just to start off with uh, Greta's latest blog. I've known that we are tackling the issue. We are discussing. We are are involved in solving the issue of having the free gas for 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 Russia. on the stock exchange, so we are scrutinized by the financial sector every day, and we are listed in, in, in Helsinki. Um, as I mentioned before, we have, and I think that is very important talking about sustainability, I think it's really the top management, the board, we are all agreed that the vision is a solar economy. We mm. will come there one day or another, but it is a journey, it's uh, going from from the uh, finite resources and going upward, ha getting better resource efficiency and also yeah. have it having better uh, going towards the, the sun. Okay, it's direct but indirect as well. Uh, ocean and, and the bio and etc. And um, here is what we are doing. And of course, we have to take this stepwise. We have taken the first investment in India, five megawatt. It's about, I don't know, 30% of what we have in Sweden. It's one first mm. step. We want to learn the technology. We want to learn. Here is we want to learn also the Indian electricity market. And uh, we need to also have the effect on, on, the, on the net, etc. So it's, it's getting the knowledge. How can we continue this? How can we get this new technology inside? 100% of our assets or investment in Europe 100% free at the moment. We are investing in, in nuclear. We are refurbishing the hydro. That is a big challenge, the hydro, because we see a lot of, of new uh, legislation coming in and also taxation of hydro is increasing terribly. But we also then take into CHP, combined heat and power. We, we have to invest very flexible. We can use waste, we can use bio, but we have to see all different sources, we have to be very flexible so that we can tackle what is happening in the pricing and everything in the future. And this is the way forward, what we think is important. Wave technology, we believe that that is an issue that will come forward. We are doing several different projects. But at the, mo at s at the same time, also look into the consumer. They will have an important role uh, and be more active. We will have more volatile um, production in the future. So we have to integrate the consumer and give them also a more important role and to help them in that respect. But um, also about hydro and other things, the adaptation is, is there, is already here. We are doing big investments in the dam, dam safety. We have taken new uh, criteria to set what we should obtain. And this is now being billions of Swedish crowns that we are investing at the moment. And we are upgrading the network, etc., cetera, to, to keep. So, I mean, here we are, have to take these measures. 
But as I also want to be talked about policies, and I don't want to go into details, but we believe that we should strengthen the EU ETS. We need to do mm -hmm. some structural reforms. We have suggestions on how you can adjust that to so that it's more in line with, what, with the economy and so on. And I think the ETS is the embryo for a more global trading. And I think we should be positive there when we look at California, we see what's happening in South Korea, Australia, and also now coming up in China. So I think here it is, I want to have the positive attitude towards this. At the same time, just as we heard from the minister, I mean, the measuring is important to control. That is the way to go forward, to really be uh, transparent and to work with this in the whole, uh, in the whole company. And of course, here's the commitment from the management and going down the whole, uh, the, the whole uh, company. And here we are putting a lot of effort and somebody can question it, but we believe that this is a way that is needed for a company. And um, I would say that's, that's a way that's important for us. <laughs> so this is a few words about how we are tackling this. And we can also say that we are trying also to be active in the political debate and push pressure. And mm. we are, for instance, we are a member of Haga Institute at Sport Environment and so on. So that's a way also to get out the message what is important for the future. Okay, thank thank you. thanks a lot. Um, really very interesting. Uh, and to hear, obviously, that you did not make the same decision than in 1999 as Vattenfall did um, about investing and uh, investing in, in uh, fossil uh, energy sources, hoping for a technology, obviously, that later on uh, didn't uh, show to be uh, effective. Is no. that, is that you know, looking at just a question there, looking at future technologies and so on, um, how important is it to be aware of these challenges when you decide on what kind of technologies and energy futures you're looking at? Well, I think it's important to have that vision and, and to build up the knowledge. And we decided two years ago to have a, a special um, department just looking at solar. Mm. And then it was just a question, should we invest in it or not? We didn't know, but we <coughs> need to get the knowledge inside the company. We cannot only go to a consultant, we can do it sometimes, but mm. we need to build a, the, a solid knowledge inside. And I think this is driven us that we really understand what is now happening and it's going so fast and mm. we have to be in that mm. business. But I can, just as uh, what I've heard before I, I started in Fortum, I mean, we bought the, a lot of hydro in Sweden and um, we had then the estimate that we that it should be a price on carbon, because I know that the reaction from the market was that we were paying too much. Mm. But we had that vision, and I think that is really, you need to have that long-term vision. Mm. Wh where are we going? So do you, s I mean, th this is an interesting example. I mean, you, uh, you were actually anticipating a, a different kind of carbon market than yeah. obviously has developed. Um, how, uh, if you look at the risks, and, we and Matt Sasha mentioned the carbon bubble, uh, but we can see a rapid development of carbon-based energy resources like fracking and others around the world. How much is that threatening your strategy to invest in renewable resources uh, in you know, 10, 15 year well perspective? It's, it's in, well, but of course, at the moment, and I'm, I, it, it's really, this is what I want to say before, it's really what we see as on the long-term pricing. And of course, at the <coughs> moment, the <coughs> investments are slowing down. That's, mm. that's the situation. But of course, here in, in the Nordic, we have oversupply. So I mean, so that's why, of course, we are looking at other markets and uh, to see, but we are investing in the Baltics where we have then CHP for bio and waste mm. and, and uh, where there is need. So we have to look at where, th where the market is, mm -hmm. is of interest. So you, do, you have the long-term mm -hmm. support of your owners to still yes. continue to work in that direction? Yes, yeah. okay. I would say that. Okay, very interesting. Thank mm -hmm. you very much for that. And let's move to the final uh, example, uh, a completely different market, completely different company, uh, but uh, someone I know who representing this company and market very enthusiastically. Uh, Anna Borjur, corporate strategist from Polar Bröd. Mm -hmm. Yes. How do you approach 
these issues. I will show you. Polar bears we heard about, <laughs> but polar <laughs> bröd, is that yeah. also a threat for you, climate change? I will show you. In you eight minutes, the world, the world, um, the, the insights about the world and what consequences that has for polar bröd. This article uh, came last weekend about the release of my novel Tunna Veggar, Thin Walls, uh, where I said this. Is it a little bit uh, loud, this one? It's, I hear a sound. Is it too, too close to that one. Thank you. Um, uh, for Schrödinger's Schröden is hard to translate, but roughly I said that none of the modern worlds, the, w the way we provide for ourselves, or the ways we provide for ourselves in the modern world are long-term sustainable. So first, I'll briefly show you what facts are behind that rather grim statement. And secondly, I will tell you the decisions that this insight has led to in our family distance. Can you turn this one off, please? It's, it's circulation okay. in the sound somewhere, yeah. yeah. This is from my TED talk, The Dawn of a New Economy, where I look at these sustainability circles as three aspects of supply three ways through which we humans provide for ourselves. So, very briefly, how do these three logics work? First, they look at the actual economy, the management of limited physical resources, revealing that this decides what is possible to eat in the short term. Um, this is an image of world economic history uh, of the last 2,000 years, showing different countries' share of world productivity where red is the share of China, and orange is that of India. And you can see that 200 years ago, just as in all of human history before that, productivity equaled population. Because almost everyone worked just to feed themselves. In a muscle-powered society, energy surplus is a privilege for a small elite. But something extraordinary happened in the late uh, 19th century, and we all know in this room that it was the fossil era that had begun, and countries that built fossil-powered industry produced high growth per capita figures. <coughs> Green area here is the United States, and you can see other Euro uh, European countries also. This graph depicts the use of oil measured in millions of barrels per day after the Second World War and up to the plateau of peak cheap oil that we recently passed. We need to remember that this is the enormous energy behind the fact that most Swedes, for instance, are no longer poor peasants living off the soil, but affluent and educated city dwellers typically working in services. Uh, I'll go back to this one. Look at the timing here, 1970 and the 2000s era. Just remember that. Um, when the growth of productivity in the real economy has decelerated or even stopped in the West, our method of choice to handle this has unfortunately been to artificially create what I call pseudo growth. This is a graph depicting the amount of money in the world showing that when the increase in energy use and thereby economic throughput, i.e. growth, was no longer possible. Uh, humanity al instead allowed the amount of money to take off. This is another way of putting it uh, higher throughput in the economy. You just lend more money. This is a trend that has, has exploded since the onset of the ongoing financial crisis of five years. Now the Federal Reserve alone creates $85 billion every month out of thin air to fill the holes just in the American economy. That we must add the other central banks, money printing, and the issuing of, lo of loans by private banks. So now we have a world of financial superabundance. The money supply seems to be limitless. We are in an era of QE infinity. However, the most important aspect of supply is the ecological. And contrary to the amount of money, the biosphere which keeps us all alive is not limitless. Thanks to the work of Johan Rockström and others, we have since 2009 known that we are transgressing at least three of nine planetary boundaries. And we do this most aggressively through our industrialized, cheap food-producing agriculture. 
agriculture is actually not only the biggest driver of eutrophication and biodiversity loss, uh, it is also the single largest emitter of greenhouse gases driving climate change. About 40% of Earth's land surface, and it's the best land, is altered to grow crops. And this, all of this that I've just told you now, briefly put, is how we learn that climate change is but one of many dangerous symptoms of systemic failure. Prevailing economic practices and rules are based on the mistaken assumptions that the planet and its resources are infinite and the biosphere indestructible. So, how do these insights impact Kulaldred's decision? We realize that in order to protect the food supply and the way our children and their children can provide for themselves, come next five generations and onwards, we need to become, become agents of change. And we have for this identified four main areas. We need to help change agricultural practices so they will work in the long run. The way we produce food today will not. So this must change and it will become more expensive. We need to affect fossil-free freights, energy production, and packaging. No small task. So we have just what, two minutes, maybe mm. one minute. <laughs> I will just briefly dive into two of these challenges. Uh, let's, let's look at the, the aim uh, for Pulado to come to uh, fossil-free supply chain. These are the present flows. Uh, <coughs> you missed what? <laughs> okay, these are present, <laughs> fossil-free supply chain as of present for Polarbred. Um, uh, this is considerable, but it is um, insufficient. And we have increasing problems with bad maintenance on Stambana, uh, the artery for our flows. So what we need from the state is first and foremost a working infrastructure. And this is on the wish list for the future. Uh, many more destinations for commercially viable rail freight. A rail hub in uh, freight. A rail hub in Elsken stops in Bedum, where we also have a bakery. And we're looking for ways to make this happen in collaboration with others. Shipping is also an option when fossil-free ships become commercially viable. Our bakeries uh, in energy, we were really uh, well off so to speak, because our bakeries are already running on Norland's hydropower. Uh, we have zero emissions in our production, but we have raised the bar. We are, going, we are investing to be energy self-sufficient through adding new renewable energy onto the grid. Recently, we in invested more than 100 million Swedish krona to build three wind turbines that by the end of next year will produce 80% of Polarbred's energy needs. And uh, this is also actually a hedging against coming uh, price shocks in energy. A real hedging, not the derivative kind that I, I sort of don't trust. Um, because the ecological logic will prevail, not the man-made rules of the game or the short-sighted this we can do right now of our present economy and the completely, pardon my French, delusional financial economy. There simply won't be any business as usual in the times ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> and, and also thank you for the sort of, you know, taking the global perspective and then translating it to what it means for you in practice as a company. And I think that it's very, you know, this is key for this whole debate. Uh, first of all, I'm going to be very unpolite because I'm going to have a panel now. <laughs> you are, you're not well. No, I, that's <laughs> not true. Well, you joined us for the panel this morning. So we give a warm applause, please. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Birgitta, thank you very much for really contributing. But I would ask, like to ask the other panelists to come up. Peter, you have uh, <coughs> agreed to join us also at this final session. Per, thank you. Per Klevnes. Uh, Annika hey. Elias, where are you? Annika Elias, who is uh, new to us today, uh, Chairman Ledana and CEC European Managers. Is this the whole panel? Did I miss someone? 
Okay, you had your opportunity. Now it's too late. <laughs> so why don't we start with you, uh, Annika? Because you haven't had a chance uh, to, to really sort of give your perspective. You are from Ledarna. That, so that, you know, that sounds great yes, for doesn't me, it? doesn't it? So what we need, we always say that. We need the leadership yeah. to change. Give us your perspective after listening to this afternoon's presentations and uh, debate. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, we've reached the end of the day, and at the end of the day, I think it's time to get practical. Uh, because we had a question quite early in the program today. Uh, somebody asked, we have all this knowledge. Why is nothing happened? We've had it for a long time. Uh, and I actually think that some of the problems is in implementing all these good knowledge and all these good decisions into the companies. Uh, we know from the last uh, um, report from, uh, from uh, the Global Compact that uh, only 35% of the companies implement the strategies that have been made on the CEO level, mm -hmm. on, the, on the high level. And of course, we all understand that it has to it is decisions have to be made <coughs> on a corporate level, and they have to be based on advanced knowledge and so forth. But from there, to make something happen, we have to implement the strategies in all the levels of management in the companies. Mm -hmm. And I think that is what's a bit missing in this discussion. What, what, and why isn't that happening then? I mean, yes, we can conclude that we must you know, implement mm -hmm. our strategies and everybody knows climate is changing, it's going to threaten uh, our survival, etc. But why? Wha well, what are the barriers? What are them? I would say it needs a new kind of thinking because it, it um, managers have to be given resources, of course, time, people, knowledge, to really implement, to work with these questions. Mm -hmm. But it's also a question of, of changing the way we measure things in the companies. Today we have managers who are only measured by the short-term results mm -hmm. that they deliver. Uh, we need managers who can focus at the same time on the short-term results, but also on the long perspective. We need new, a new kind of manager and we need new conditions for the managers. Of course, it's much easier just to make a declaration, to put a, a stamp on your brand for the company mm. that you work with sustainability issues. But it's not, it, it takes a lot more to really get it to work down to the lowest level. But if we don't, nothing will happen. I'm sure of that. Okay, thank you very much. Peter, I will soon let give you a chance to comment a little bit on the presentations also from the companies mm. and things you are picking up there. But before we do that, there might be a few other things that <coughs> could come into the discussion that maybe I would like you to comment on. Per, you are one of the few representatives of, of the sort of interesting and hopefully very lively discussions we had prior to this session. Uh, you can't summarize what happened in 10 groups, but you know, are there things that you could pick up from the discussions without being too biased to your own group uh, yes, that you believe yes. could be interesting to pull into this discussion? Yes, I've, I've had the privilege of reading so ev for clarity, everything that you talked about and wrote down and voted for was then written on forms and notes in turn were handed to me. So take it for what it is, several filters between your own thoughts and what I'm saying, but I wanted to pick out a few themes and provide just a grain of synthesis as well to, to hopefully stimulate the discussion further here. The first thing to say is that um, it came through very strongly that financial incentives, of course, will be key. No surprises, I think. But it was interesting to see through the various discussions that um, it was not just the level of, say, a carbon tax or an investment incentive, but also the certainty that they will be there. And some groups then concluded that actually the way to get there is a global deal, and that financial incentives on their own, for all their beauty in, in channeling resources so throughout the economy and making other things happen and, and providing the certainty of the future, may need to be underpinned by a political and governance structure as mm. well. So that's one thing that came through very strongly. Um, at the same time, it also came through that, well, it may be a little bit pie in the sky, um, this may not be happening, and there are several other influencing channels that need to be activated or unblocked, or however you want to call it. So one perhaps overarching theme there was that of transparency and trust, I think. There needs to be transparency about winners and losers, and actually we debate about what that means. There needs to be transparencies, transparency so consumers know uh, what business activities, what consequences they actually have. Um, beyond, you know, if everything is priced in by carbon prices and everything, you could say you just need the price, but the strong feeling that no, we need labeling, we need that sort of that sort of uh, mechanisms as well. Um, we need to 
uh, we need uh, an annual report of companies to include an assessment of risk. Uh, we need consumers to have full access to information about the products they buy. And we need science to be transparently um, providing information into policy and policy to be able to turn around and say, yes, this is a science on which we're basing this. Mm. So that's another mechanism, but very much in the same vein, that then if we get these things in place, then that will unblock things that have sto been stopped in their tracks so far. Now, these two in turn may enable a third category that came through, which is one of innovation. Technology came through, we need innovation, we need technology to come, um, and that may require big markets to become demand pools for this technology, may need, that may need investment in, in re research and development, but also we need new business models. And there was a pervading sense that once we have the demand and the market mechanisms in place, then innovation will be able to happen, mm -hmm. but there's innovation, lots of innovation is necessary. But this is quite a positive picture, I think, right? Uh, we, we put the right mechanisms in place, we improve our, our, our trans transparency, we get, get better trust, and then things will, you know, our current system will work and will get us on the trajectory we need to be. And there was a, were categories of responses that hinted at a, a slightly m slight modification to that, perhaps. While several of you, the groups, actually came back and said, we need a new value definition. It is not enough that we provide the right signals within the current system. We need something other than GDP. We need ecosystem services. We need to go beyond GDP. That's quite a challenge because it then tells us that climate change is a more unmanageable problem mm -hmm. than perhaps would be suggested by a classical uh, economics argument. And actually, we need to go beyond it. So it's a challenge. Another challenge was that of how to get a long-term perspective in given the requirements of in, uh, investors for returns over a short time horizon given corporate governance and how it is structured and reporting mechanisms of quarterly, quarterly uh, um, and, and accountability mechanisms we have, maybe even the education of co children that they will make a difference in the future, let's hope so, um, and even into discussions of cognitive science, maybe we're inherently biased. You know, so again, a challenge on several fronts to the notion that if we get the signals and institutions right, then we will, we will get there. Um, so I'll stop there and just give <coughs> these as, as indications of some of the discussions I have. Thanks a lot, Per. Uh, really uh, fascinating to, during a coffee break, be able to summarize discussions that much. I, I won't dare to ask them if you actually did, uh, you know, deliver a speech that you came up with yourself or if you actually did, you know, follow what they discussed. But I'm sure you did. I'm sure you did. Uh, can I go back to you, P Peter, also after having heard these presentations and also this last point in particular maybe about, you know, how do we transform into a more long-term thinking? How do we provide the tools also for companies to do so. Uh, can state-owned companies be much more proactive also in taking a long-term perspective? I mean, they also, have, uh, they also have demands on return and so on. Can you give us some, some insights? Uh, <coughs> I can try to elaborate in some way, <coughs> at least. I think if, it, if you want to take this question seriously, mm -hmm. as we all do, I think, in this room, you have to begin from the top, and that is the owners of the company and it's the board of the companies. Mm. I can control the board members of public owned companies. And when we decide board members nowadays, you don't have to have a PhD in sustainable you know, wisdom, but you have to have some enthusiasm or curiosity or some knowledge or whatsoever. It's, it's a prime target when we're looking for people. Mm. Then we can put some kind of a pressure on the board, which we do with our demands for the targets. Mm. Then the board can put pressure on the leadership and so on. I think you must begin there. There are enthusiasts, people all around the company, but it must, it must have a heart in the very top, top of the company. Mm. And that's why I think it's very interesting to, to listen to Anna, because you're an uh, uh, owner as well as yeah. the leadership of your company. Mm. Uh, and I think that's the key here, and that's what we have to require from all companies. It's not enough to have you know, enthusiast people around. <coughs> And that leads me to Sasha. Well, I think you're a symbol of sustainability, and I think that's good. <laughs> <laughs> what I, though, lack is footprint in your own organization. <laughs> I would see the CEO of Nordea or the, the, the board of directors once pronounce the word sustainability. I don't think they know it. Maybe you should learn them. Nor Nord Nordea is the most bonus intense bank in Norway, uh, in, in, in Scandinavia, in Scandinavia, <laughs> in the Nordic countries, uh, in, in Norway, Norway. In Norway, in Norway as well. <laughs> it's the most bonus intense bank whatsoever in, in the Nordic Europe region. Mm. And we all know 
that is a big fear that short-term decision have a negative impact on sustainability. Mm. I would like the board of directors, I would like the CEO to discuss these things once. I've never ever heard it. Mm. I would like the Nordea leadership discuss money laundering. Mm. They, they, they were fined by the Swedish FSA one year ago. Mm. I would like a speech saying it would never ever happen again. So I think you're doing a great job, but I require more footprints in your own organization. Before, I mean, before you, you answer also, I mean, it's interesting because in particular, if you can sort of add on the fact, because as you say, I mean, you are very proactive. You, can, you operate in Nordea. You're obviously very vocal. So that shows that obviously the leadership must accept the fact that you're out there being vocal. But how, how do you manage to change the way leadership is thinking in an organization like Nordea? And we are back to this because we are talking about the long-termness, we are talking about leadership, giving the right tools, etc. Well, I, no, I, I completely agree with what Peter is saying. I, I'm not sort of a, just to explain how the bank, banking system works. I work on the investment side that we have a bank, and bank is doing their own things. And I completely agree, and I used to say that my one of my biggest challenges is actually to change the organization that I work in, being the biggest Nordic institutions with all its rules and all its cultures and traditions, including the leadership in the bank. And I completely subscribe to that, and I agree. And as a result of that, we are not investing in our own bank in one of our best funds that we are selling on the Swedish market. <laughs> so that's, that's number one. Number two, oh, uh, number two on in yeah. terms of... Um, uh, how do we, and this is the very important for, the, for me to know, you being the owner or partly the owner of the bank, that you're actually telling me that information today. It's very good for me to know because then I can take it on further on into my organization and ask Christian Klaus and why he's never talking about sustainability, which I think he does internally, but probably not towards the owners. Uh, going back to the financial yeah. regulators and financial um, ministry and, and all the rules of the engagement, I think it's so poor uh, that we are still discussing, and in general, and I don't think you could find that only in Nordea, I think you can find it in all the big banks in general, that sustainability really is not a big issue. Because we really are not interested in sustainability because we really don't think we can make money on it. Mm. And w I think it's a much bigger problem, that I think it's systemic. And what I can see it in, in, in from my perspective, being invested, is that I'm actually struggling because we are trying to, to do things, and it's difficult to do that, because level playing field is not the same. And we need to have a rules, and what we think by rules and, and regulation or whatever, is that we actually get back to the government, which is proactive, asking them, please, Peter, and please, government, Swedish government, can you please make a law so all the financial institutions, including asset owners and asset managers, disclose information about how they work with this in all their investment products. And I'm the first one to subscri subscribe to that. And Odea is the first bank to sign on, on this particular thing. So that will be very, very interesting. What do you say about that, Peter? I mean, that's a quite sort of clear yes. call. <coughs> I, I, I think it's a very good idea. But let me tell you the reality is we are part of the European Union, whether we like it or not. We have to compromise with seven 27 other countries. Mm. And let's just take Poland, who had the leadership one year ago. They are not interested in these things whatsoever. And that goes with a lot of countries as well. So we are trying to do something what Sasha is suggesting, and, and we encourage that, we emphasize that in the European Union, but it's not that easy. But on the other hand, I think, if we think it's an important question, and if we think that customer likes what we are doing in this regard, there is nobody to stop you to do it on your own, mm. I guess. In Sweden. In Nordea. Uh -huh. <laughs> but if we do it on our own, how, d how will customers be able to compare between me and what SCB or any other bank is doing? How will they, what is the reference point for the information? This is the biggest problem because I would like to do that and I will do it in my products, but then you will sit down with the information that will not be comparable with anybody else because SCB or somebody else may disclose their own information without no clear rules how that information needs to be. So we don't have a same, and I think this is, should be something that Swedish government should drive on European Union level, exactly as you're pointing out, because that's where the sort of a biggest issue is. While we talk about this, when Peter is saying that Poland is not interested in this, Poland is not interested in CO2 neutral stuff, they are not interested in anything that has to do with sustainability because they are losing competitive advantage in their economic growth. 
So this problem is much bigger than financial side. Mm. And this also indicates what type of problems that we are facing when it comes to sustainable development in European level, which is far bigger than we, I think, imagine. Okay, thanks a lot. I mean, it's, it's clear we are coming back to the factor that clear political signals, frameworks is key. And it's getting increasingly complex when you have to then adapt to the European level and in some cases also the global level. You will have chances to get comments, but I want to see what is cooking out there. We, we don't have that much time, but I want to get a couple of cooking things from the audience as well, because, yeah, Nina, you are <laughs> one of the organizers as well, so, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm prepared to... Yeah, I understand that. I understand that. Uh, I'm so impressed by the work you're doing, Peter Norman, and also the initiative you took uh, with the sustainable development within the state-owned companies. It's really impressive. But I wonder, when will, when will you tell the state-owned companies that they have to be concrete with their climate reductions, with their targets and so, because uh, what I know, the climate uh, within the sustainability is still not obligatory. It is, you, you can choose if you want to have it in your report. Okay, so it's the whole issue of how much should you actually prescribe yeah. certain areas and how much is voluntary. Can you answer that while I'm looking for someone else? Eager okay, to make comments? Uh, what uh, it, it, it's a relevant and good question. What we have done is to define sustainability in a more diversified way. We have gender equality, for instance, uh, and diversity as a, broad, as a broad range. So what we have said to the companies, they can pick whatever they like regarding this kind of a pie chart I'll show you on my graph. Some companies will choose, for instance, CO2 emissions, like LKAB and Vattenfall, for instance. Some countries, like the dramatic, uh, you know, the theater, dramatic theater in Sweden, they, I don't think they have any CO2 emissions whatsoever. They will go for gender equality and so on. So different companies will do differently here. So, so in that regard, we are not doing compulsory emission targets. We are doing more broad, sustainable targets. Okay, thank you. Let's collect a couple of comments. <coughs> Amber from Messia, I'm an intern here. <laughs> um, I actually picked up on how you said that a lot of business decisions were driven by the investors and the owners. Um, is there some kind of information product that we could give to a pool of investors somehow? Is there a way to access the investors? Is there some tool that we could possibly educate a little bit more on sustainability if we do want to push that as a, a driving factor for businesses? Okay, so more driving uh, from the investors per se to make them, you know, change. Sasha is shrudding away, I don't know why, but... But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. just, why not I the AP fund, fund leadership for one? Yeah, exactly. So, le but that let's keep it huge. on the table. I will get back to you. We have one comment here more and one comment downstairs, so please. Uh, Klaus Tholin from SP, the Swedish Technical Research Institute, one of the state companies. Uh, it was uh, touched upon earlier that we, we need to have maybe another economic system in, in uh, some years. Uh, exponential growth, uh, maybe it's not the solution. Uh, when is it time to start that discussion and when do we have to change the system? That's great. In the next generation probably, that's what we normally say. It's better to push it forward. I think that's an excellent question. I yes, think I will let you answer it also. You <laughs> I will start with you. But yes, just to... Ta uh, ja, Elin Söderberg, ESAM. Uh, uh, I was wondering uh, two things. Uh, the, the International Energy Agency said, I think it's two years ago, that all investments um, in fossil industry or mm. production need to be, we need to stop doing, the doing them after 2017. Otherwise, we need to close them down before their economic lifetime. Uh, and this spring, they released a new report uh, saying that the potential for renewable energy is higher than the energy demand, excluding nuclear power, which is not renewable. And I was wondering, uh, <laughs> one thing, uh, the state owner of uh, energy industries like Vattenfall, um, do you consider this? Do you know this? And what are your response about investing in fossil fuels after uh, 2017? Mm -hmm. And the other part is, the investment side, uh, I had another investment company discussing uh, this week that they have a blacklist on companies and they also have a, a top 100 fund with the uh, ethic investments. And in those ethic investments, they include oil companies. And I was wondering, how do you do it, Nordea? And uh, also connected to uh, the EA, 
international energy agencies report. Okay, thank you. thank you very much. So the carbon bubble is back, and if there is an exit strategy maybe now for <laughs> Vattenfall in place to get rid of the CO2. So uh, I promise, Anna, get back to you first on these questions and other comments, because we are sort of wrapping up. What, what would well, you like to add? The point of my presentation is basically that I think that we are in a, that since 2007, we are at the end of, uh, there's debt saturation. There is, uh, uh, with a financial crisis. It's, uh, there are um, climate costs coming up with all the storms and, and, and floodings and drought, droughts and things we see in the food <coughs> supply chain. So my, my basic uh, answer to you is it's time now. It's been overdue to change the system because we are acting like, well, interest on money is number one. And that is a natural law and you need to have that. Mm. And everything else has to bend for that. But nature will, will tell us sooner or later that this is, we can have this idea that mm. <laughs> how much we want, but it, it, nature will, will the, the, the real supply chains will crumble if we don't change the way we use them. Mm. And that will mean that growth in terms of more increasing consumption will have to step back. Mm. I mean, you're not a listed company, are you? No. no? It's a family company. Yes. I mean, just briefly, y you may I don't know, I mean, you haven't been in the leadership of a listed company. How, mu how, how much easier do you think it is for you as a company to actually be very proactive from the fact that you're not a listed company? I think it's much easier because if I and my sister, who are the main owners, mm. are uh, can agree, in th and if we can just have the uh, just enough support from the other <laughs> four <laughs> people. We can do whatever <laughs> we want. Oh, so it would, requ I would require that I agree with my sister, you say? My. <coughs> <coughs> oh, okay. Oh, that, and I, so and we you have values that say that we don't, um, uh, Polarbit is not only there to give money to, mm. to the, its owners, it's, it's there for other reasons. Um, uh, uh, profit is a means, not an end. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. From Ledana's perspective, just I mean to also get your sort of final wrap-up points from this discussion. Well what specifically do you believe, from your perspective, can be done? Well, I was very um, enthusiastic to he hear from the conclusion of the discussions that uh, we have been talking about uh, values and uh, trust, which is sort of the core of the leadership uh, in a company. Uh, today we are talking a lot about everybody's looking to the politics for, for the politicians for guidance. Obviously, most of these questions are really on the the <coughs> macro level of everything, uh, both nationally and of course globally. Mm. Uh, but I say that um, if we start by just doing a bit of what every company promises, we would get a long way. Mm. Because if you look, especially around in Sweden. There is actually n almost no company who has not a good sustainability uh, policy. But since it's not implemented and not executed, we are where we are today. Mm. I, I, un I fully understand that not everything can be solved that way. But just give the power to and the, and the mandate to the managers and s let's start by acting and uh, walk the talk. Mm. So there is a lack between the, the rhetoric and action. Yes, and if absolutely. You, if you then, you have Peter Norma next to you. Yeah. So if you <laughs> then you know, have a chance here to say how, wha well what, what is that you want? I would not turn to the politics because the politics is, is, uh, is not the counterpart in this. No. I would turn to the, the company leadership. Themselves. Yeah, the boards, of course, where everything has to start. They have to give the mandate to the managers. Mm. Uh, they can't just talk and then uh, live on like uh, always before. You talked about bonuses, Peter, before, and I think that is one small thing that is at the heart of mm. this. As long as you measure all the managers on their short-term results, uh, the economic results only, what will they strive to achieve? Well, profit, yeah. of course, to begin with. Mm. And that goes for almost all level of management. You have also to reward uh, a good work in the sustainability area if you want to change something and to reward long-term behavior. Mm. And hopefully demonstrate that such investment actually benefits the profit in the yes, long run. Yes, of course. Okay, <coughs> two, two short comments. First of all, on 
and the state-owned pension funds, the AP funds. <coughs> Here we had an legislation in year 2000 where the pension fund should take consideration to environmental and ethic, um, uh, ethic considerations. And all of them had done that, uh, some, some in a small extent and some to a, to a more, more, more large extent. We can discuss it, but it was good or, or, or bad, it should be, should, be, should be wider or so. Now there's a lot of inquiries going on and the whole pension system in Sweden will be refurbished. Uh, and all of this analysis is now on, on the table on the Standing Committee of Social Insurance. So in, <coughs> let's say, half a year from now, we will have a decision regarding the Swedish pension system, which will also include uh, investment guidelines for, the invest for these pension funds. And hopefully, and that's my personal view, hopefully we will tighten this, this, uh, uh, these topics in some way that will take, I think, more consideration to, to the environment, mm -hmm. the first thing. The second thing of Vattenfall, uh, I think that to turn Vattenfall, a Swedish electricity company, is a, like a, you know, turn a super tank, <laughs> I would say. We are doing that right now. Uh, the Vattenfall went, from, uh, as I told you, from zero to 90 million ton per year in emissions in seven years. Now we're trying to go the other way around. Uh, the vision of Vattenfall is, of course, only to have non-fossil uh, plants, only to have water, sun, wind, and nuclear power, which you can like or not. But I think that's the very much the vision of Vattenfall. Mm. So, so you are actually clearly stating that it's to go back and get rid of the fossil fuel uh, that they have today. Definitely. It's mm. a question of time. Mm. And it's a question about, you know, you must, I mean, you can, I it is almost impossible today to sell every plant they have in mm. Germany. It's so much. So you have to do it in, in, a, in a fashionly order. Okay, good. But it's a vision there. Thank you very much. <coughs> Sasha. Well, they will probably be forced to buy more. Uh, and the reason for that is that we have, uh, somebody has mentioned that earlier, the investments in renewable energy have decreased with 11% last year globally, and the only country in the world that invests in renewable energy is China. And we have invested $680 million in one year in new prospecting of fossil fuels, and that equivalents to 200 uh, stock-listed companies. This is the facts, information taken by HSBC, it's one of the biggest banks in the world, it's not taken by an NGO. In principle, it means the next 10 years, because we are pricing in the proven resources, it's $6 trillion invested in prospecting of new fossil fuels, going back to shale <coughs> gas and all of that. And everybody knows this. And that equivalents to four, giga uh, four gigaton CO2 emissions. And, and that basically means that the market, the financial markets are betting on politicians not to be able to hinder. Exactly. So uh, this is sort of a catastrophic a, mm, climate change. It's, it's very interesting. But according to science. That's one side. I think with the AP funds, this sounds extremely good. I really hope that AP funds will have a clear climate target. And it's also surprising that Sweden, which is one of the leading countries, at least on paper in the world, when it comes to this, that we don't have one of the AP funds truly investing in renewables, truly trying to invest in the companies who are trying to achieve CO2 neutral solutions or carbon emissions and so on. Because from a, from a private sector perspective, we are interested in doing this. But going back to one of the questions I think you asked, I mean, seriously, investment community, we don't, we hire usually very qualified people from all sort of a part of the world. We have information we need in order to make decisions, but we don't have incentives. Mm. It's so simple. I mean, it's sad to say that, but we don't have the incentives. We are not giving incentives. We are not evaluated on the basis of these incentives. So that's one of the problems. And nobody's complaining about that. So, I mean, okay. going back to say, yeah, I can provide you with a list of 3,500 companies we do invest in. And we are trying to invest in companies who are more sustainable. Avoiding the oil companies, fossil fuel companies, if you say from an index perspective, mm. they represent 20% of the global index. If you take that out, then I need, you to I need to tell you also, well, I'll try to replace it. But then you have to take a hit on, on returns. Mm. And are you prepared to do that? I don't know, but apparently clients are not prepared to do that. Not the majority of them. Mm. No. Okay, and I know I saw you had a point, but we have to say that for the mingle because I also need to be give pair a chance, and then we are actually going to have to close because we are it's out of time. So it's, a, it's a wonderful privilege to yeah. be the, the, the person standing between you and uh, refreshments. No, uh, that, that's Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay, I got a buffer. Um, I mean, I think I think you're on. What, what's what's uh, from uh, from 
from SEI's and perspective and perhaps trying to represent the broader research community and not just doing research but communicating research, there, there are some clear takeaways here. Mm. Um, if we talk about leadership and organizations and the fact that you have a disconnect between stated ambition and what actually happens, if you talk about the, the AP funds and the fact that it's a contention and debate about how much a contention targets without hit, hits and return, if we talk about Nudea and the disconnect between leadership on one side and, and pioneers on the other hand, I mean, maybe you're the, the startup experiment, and if you manage, fine, it will spread, otherwise not, so no pressure. Um, <laughs> but they're, but, they're, but they're, I think the, the emerging message very much here is that it isn't enough to say it, fossil fuels are 3% of global GDP. We have models that show that it, the cost of action, if everyone does it at the same time, needn't be so high. And the cost, if we don't do very much, is very high to us indeed, not just in 70 years, but maybe in 10 years or 20 years, it's still too far away. Mm. That message, the Stern Report message, has done a lot, but, but isn't fully doing it. And there is another message, I think, from what we know about the research and, and from we, what we know about the, the economic system institutions, which says that there actually is a substantial overlap between long-term sources of growth for an economy and of sources of competitiveness and what we normally would call climate action. That I don't, can't promise that they could, if the research were done, we could show that all of these, we could th cut through the thicket of all of these um, problems that we've just discussed. But certainly this is an absolutely critical research agenda to come with credible uh, messages about that overlap and how yeah. mainstream concerns can come come into climate concerns rather than the other way around. Uh, good news is we are trying to work on this. <laughs> um, but uh, that, that, that to me would be to formulate a research program that to some extent taps into what we talked about here. Excellent. Thank you very much. And more on that will follow quite soon. We have to keep the tension up. Huh? And indeed. So, Jacob, I'm sorry, I, you know, five minutes late. Uh, you started off this, uh, this seminar today. Um, it's been a very full day. You know, extremely interesting discussion, I think. And of course, since it's now about coming up with a final few very wise points, I hand over to you instead. So, Jacob, please. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you to the panel before they step down. Okay, you remember that? Yeah. Okay, I'll thanks. Too, thanks, thanks. Okay. If, you're, if you're leaving now. No, no, I will <laughs> sit here. So. Okay. <laughs> very good, excellent. Uh, and thanks, everybody. I think we, we just, as a short reflection, we started off, off in the morning tracing back this seminar okay. to the 3C company organization that actually started this. And, and we saw that, that uh, the nucleus behind it was actually Vattenfall, who I've been talking a lot about here. They had a vision uh, back in 2007 to start to change the way they were investing. But as we know, the investment climate is changing very fast, as fast as probably the weather and the climate is doing. And technology also changed. The discovery that promising technology perhaps wasn't the what they had hoped for. So I think th there's a message in this, and that is that it's changing fast. We have to, to have these types of debates where we look at what the opportunities are, where we learn from the business models and try to, to identify the solutions. And I think that's what we've done today. We looked at a lot of solutions. We also looked at a lot of new research paths and opportunities in this space, from investments to regulation. So we have a, a, a mouthful of work to, to go back to, to the drawing board with. So we are very much committed now to, to try to wrap this up as a team, and then we will circulate the findings to all of you, and, 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 and it's been a marvelous experience during the day. So finally, the, the, there are some thanks that I have to do here, because I think they are, they are very, very important, and of course to the panel for your frank discussions, not only this panel, but the previous panels that we have had uh, on, on, the ta on the board today. Thanks to all the speakers that have come here and, and invested a lot of time and to all the participants that have done so much in the table discussions. And, and, and also would like to, to recognize one specific individual that's been driving this huge organization, and it's Anna Lervdal from SEI, who has managed this uh, organization. And uh, there you are, Anna, uh, thank you. Uh, it's, not, it's been a big task to get so many stakeholders together, but a marvelous job. And finally, Johan, uh, you, you, you kept us on time, isn't it? So we, we, wish we should end now. So all of you, great experience, and we are so happy that you, you came here, and we hope you got some good feedback to bring back to your colleagues. Thanks.